today's programme, I'm taking tea with Mr Twining, investigating the story of this stripy survivor and getting up ahead of steam on an old-style railway. But first, let me take you on a journey back to the 40s. London, 1948. The 14th Olympiad of the modern era. Here, the athletes of the nations gathered to pit their strength and skill. Back in 48, when London last staged the Olympics, the capital was still finding its feet after the war. So the games themselves were a pretty modest affair. They called them the austerity games, and they certainly were a far cry from the razzmatazz of the modern Olympics. The athletes didn't have villages, they had to sleep in schoolhouses and barracks, and as rationing was still on, they even had to bring their own sandwiches. One by one, all the original venues from 1948 have been demolished or converted into different uses. Today there's only one left, and this is it. The Herne Hill Velodrome in South London. Even in 48, this place was already something of a survivor. It actually started life in 1891, and soon became a major cycle racing venue. This was the sort of machine that graced the track in the early days. Because for those not in the know, Yes. That's quite a tricky manoeuvre with no brakes. <laughs> yes, as you just saw me demonstrate. <laughs> so, Roger, how old is this particular machine? Uh, it's certainly early 1900s. I can't give you an exact date because it's difficult with bicycles to date them to an exact year unless you're very lucky. Um, but it's certainly from all of its design features, it's early 1900s. And it was designed to be used on a path, they were called path racers. Uh, we call it a track, but they call it a pass. Well, yes. it made me want to have a go. May I have a go on this, Roger? You most certainly can. I'm going to tuck my you look, uh, trouser in. Now, have you ridden a fixed wheel I've before? I've never ridden anything like this in my life. No, well, a bicycle, but not a fixed wheel, yeah. Well, you, you see, there's no free wheel on it, so yeah. whatever you do, don't stop pedalling, because if you stop pedalling, you'll be straight over the top, and they'll probably find you in Lewisham High Street <laughs> or something. So, when you're going round, just keep pedalling, and when you want to slow down, just slow down gently put, and apply a little bit of back pressure onto the pedals okay, instead yeah, of pushing yeah. forwards. Yeah. Yes. Great stuff. Off you go. See you next week. OK. Don't forget to write. Laurel <laughs> Fignon. Yeah, it's all right. Oh, look at that. It's a natural. Time that man. 30 miles an hour. 35, 40, 45. Not quite going up the bank, but you know. Smooth, smooth, definitely. You're doing fine. He's careful, but he's very smooth. Oh, nearly stopped pedalling, watch it. This is the bit you want to see, isn't it? See if I can stop or not. <laughs> one minute, 25 seconds, pretty good. There's another one. I've got the record. Can I stop? No, just keep, I'll, I'll catch yeah. you. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you, Roger. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> I've broken my own record. Fantastic. Yeah. It's the first and only time, mind. Well, there you go. It's I mean, really good fun in this too, though. It yeah. Is. Yeah. 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 Nice old bite, that. Lovely. Yeah. I think I'd have to put in a little more legwork before I could have kept up with these chaps. Mr Bailey and Monsieur Fosseau were just two of the many famous racers to compete here during the 20s and 30s. The racing only stopped with the outbreak of war, when the velodrome was used as a barrage balloon site. By the time the fighting was over, the whole place was in a pretty sorry state. But, uh, they let it deteriorate. It was in a dreadful state. It had to be rescued and uh, uh, massive volunteers. I mean, there was weeds growing out of the banking and, uh, you know, and they needed a tremendous amount of work on it. And it's, it's a wonder it ever came back, really, when you looked at what it looked like then in those days. Dave Creasy was a young cycling fan back then. After helping to tidy the place up, he managed to get hold of a ticket for the Olympic cycling events here. So you actually attended the 1948 yeah, Olympics? Yeah, yeah. And what was the atmosphere here like then? It was a tremendous scene, really, you know, when you think about it, because it was massive people. I mean, you used to get lots of people here for the track meeting, but, I mean, that was something different. Uh, for example, the back straight uh, didn't have any seating capacity, so what they did, they brought in scaffolding and then there was planks laid on it. I mean, you wouldn't be allowed to do that today because of health and safety. But the angle it went up, you could barely see the, the, those houses. And of course, it was packed all round, you know, standing room only, uh, as well as the, the seating arrangements over there in the main building and so forth. And on the, in actual fact, the two parts there, either side where those seats are out of action, they were actually put up for the Olympics because anything that was here before was just the main building until the Olympics. 
The Olympics were the high point for this place, but the velodrome has continued to be an important landmark on the British cycling scene ever since. In recent years, it's been hard to find the money needed to keep all the old buildings up to scratch. The grandstand, which must be one of only a handful of Victorian stadiums in the capital, is out of bounds for today's spectators. And although the original Olympic seats are still in place, you'd probably be a bit saddle sore if you sat in these for any length of time. The people who run the place today would love to restore it back to tip-top condition. But in the meantime, at least the track itself is still in one piece and still a magnet for cycling fans of all ages. Well, this old velodrome certainly seen some ups and downs since these seats were filled with excited spectators for the 1948 Olympics. But I'm very pleased to see a whole new generation of kids seem to have got the cycling bug. And who knows, one day, maybe one of this lot will get their own slice of Olympic glory. From bikes to beaches, this is Haysborough on the North Norfolk coast. It's hard to believe it on a blustery day like today, but this was once a very popular resort. A hundred years ago, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle himself visited on a motoring holiday. He even wrote one of his Sherlock Holmes adventures while staying at this hotel. The sea view is even better today than it was back then, which is bad news for the locals. Coastal erosion means that the land is gradually being washed away and a watery grave probably awaits these houses sometime in the very near future. But up until about 200 years ago, it was ships and boats that the North Sea was claiming in alarming numbers. In 1789, over 600 men and 70 vessels perished in one catastrophic storm just off the coast here. Something had to be done, and this was it. The lighthouse was originally twinned with another tower closer to the cliff edge. A double act designed to guide ships safely around the treacherous Haysborough Sands, a few miles offshore. But its partner was decommissioned in the 1880s, which means this is now the oldest working light in East Anglia, a 200-year-old survivor. In 1988, the future of the lighthouse was less than bright, as it was earmarked for closure. However, a group of local women stepped into the breach and set up a trust to maintain and manage the tower, making it the UK's only independent operated lighthouse. I'm here to meet one of the women who saved the Haysborough Lighthouse. Hello there, Carol. Hello, sir. It's good to meet you. Uh, what a wonderfully impressive building. Of course, it wasn't always red and white. There were two lighthouses at Hay in Haysborough. The two lighthouses were white, so two white towers adjacent to each other was Haysborough. When there was only one white tower remaining, you couldn't distinguish it from chroma. And that's when we acquired our distinctive red and white stripes, and we've kept it red and white ever since. Lovely. So we're getting out of this weather. Oh, yes. Today, the management of lighthouses in England and Wales is the responsibility of Trinity House, which grew out of an ancient mariner's guild. When the Haysborough Trust applied to take on the job of running this place, an act of parliament had to be passed. Well, it's nice and warm in here. Yes, it is, isn't it? Costs a lot of money to keep it as warm as this, but we have to to keep the inside dry. Well, it would do with the amount of space we've got. I don't know what I was expecting, Carol, but not that it would be hollow. Oh, yes. Although it's a lighthouse, it was never lived in because the lighthouse keepers lived in the cottages which were built on either side of the lighthouse. And you've had a few rather auspicious people here, I'm noticing this plaque oh, over here. Oh, yes. We were very proud of the fact that the Queen Mother graciously agreed to come and formally reopen the lighthouse when we took over the ownership. And did the Queen Mother actually go out the lighthouse? No, she was rather elderly at the time. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't know if I'm elderly enough to be able to use that excuse. How many stairs are there? 112. 112. It's an easy climb. Do you reckon? Oh, I'm always going up there, yes. <laughs> then, really hold my hand. <laughs> I don't think I'd have been cut out to be a lighthouse keeper. My head for heights isn't all it should be. And the higher I get, the dizzier I start to feel. Halfway up, I have to admit defeat and return to base camp, leaving Carol and Richard the cameraman to push on for the summit without me. I may be gone for some time. But I tell you what, I never thought I had anything in common with the dear old Queen Mum, but it turns out I do after all. Neither of us has been to the top of Haysborough Lighthouse. It's a jolly good job I'm not the one responsible for changing the bulb. Hang on a minute, I've got bigger ones than that under my sink. They'll never see that thing out at sea, will they? 
it's only a 500 watt bulb, but it can be seen 14 to 18 miles out to sea because it's the lenses and the prisms which magnify the light and enable it to be seen for so, so far away. Obviously, um, you wouldn't, that's the same size of a garden security light, and I think that you'd be a had up if your garden security light could be seen um, 18 miles away. Despite all the hard work the Trust has put in to keep their famous landmark glowing, the future of the lighthouse is at the mercy of the elements. It may be a long way out from the cliff edge now, but if coastal erosion continues at its current rate, the tower that's guided generations of sailors through these waters will eventually fall victim to the waves itself. Coming up next, tea for two. Pinky up or down? And I get my hands on this steamy survivor. Welcome back. We have a train to catch. Next stop, the 1960s. This was the decade when diesel engines put the steam train out of business. And the famous beaching axe fell on hundreds of branch lines and local stations around Britain. One of the many victims in the east of England was a stretch of line which first started life back in the 1880s. The line ran from Norwich up through Sheringham and on to Holt, about five miles away. But in the 1960s, it was severed and Sheringham became the end of the line. This is where today's trains stop. It's functional, but not exactly romantic. And it's hard to imagine many brief encounters happening here. But it's quite a different story, a hundred yards away, where the romance of the railways is still going strong. This was Sheringham's main station in the 60s. Not a dead end, but a staging post on the journey north. It looks like a museum, or maybe a film set, waiting for the arrival of the Hogwarts Express. But first appearances can be misleading, because in fact, this is still a working station, with a daily year-round timetable of trains. And not just any old trains, but lovely old steam engines like this one. I'm climbing aboard for a chance to fulfil a dream which most boys of my generation once shared. And I don't mean scoring the winner at Wembley. Before I get to the business end, I've just got time for a quick stop at the buffet and a chat with Alan the guard. He used to work on this stretch of line in the days when it was still run by British Rail. And having spent your life going up and down this track professionally, what made you want to come back in the volunteers? Because I love steam engines. When I was 14, they were bringing me down from Nara City through here and down the Cromwell on the engines. Of course, when the railway was joined. When the right? railway was open, yeah. yeah. So you can say I've been playing about on this bit 40, 50 years nearly. It was volunteers like Alan who stepped in to revive the line after it was axed in 1964. Their aim was to preserve a regular commuter service running between Sheringham and the stops further up this stretch of the Norfolk coast. First, they had to relay several miles of track, bring back the signal box, and find suitable trains and carriages. The line finally reopened in the early 1970s, and it's been running ever since. Although it's mainly used by holidaymakers these days, it still operates a regular year-round timetable, making it a useful service for locals as well. But now the bit I've been waiting for, a chance to drive the train myself. Bob's the man in charge today. He used to drive diesel engines for a living. So the job of a steam engine driver is a lot more involved than it would be on a diesel locomotive. Well, there's a different technique. This is a Victorian technique, isn't it? Yeah, a lot of elbow grease by lifting yeah. things. Have a go on the horn. You can blow the hooter. The whistle there. Is it is whistle? There. Yeah, the whistle. Go on. Yeah. You can have a little drive. Yeah, go on. And what are we doing with this then? Well, uh, when you slow down, you lift it up the road with that. When you're going too fast, you press it down. Excellent. Slow up. Yeah. That's a bit so, stiff. Up is faster, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. And that is the time, isn't it? That's it. Yeah, there we go. 
Something to go to the heat, something you can't see when you're cool. No, it's true. Yeah, it's not the end of the track yet, is it? No, not yet. <laughs> this has got to be back at King's Cross at 7 o'clock. How long will it take, Dragon? Uh, about three weeks to get there, mate. It is an amazing feeling like you're in charge of all this power, though, yeah, isn't it? Hey, yeah, yeah. It makes you tempted yeah. to give it full steam, yeah. though, isn't it? Yeah. Not the wind, yeah. Go on. Got a sore throat there, wasn't it? Yeah. A right shot. Right shot there. Right shot, yeah. I see, got you. Amazing. Right. Then, Excellent. Yeah. At the end of each day, the engine has to be fed and watered to keep her in tip top condition for tomorrow's run. That's the job of the cleaner, Christy. But tell me, from physicist teacher to trainee steam dry driver, how did that come about? Well, teaching physics, I mean, it's, it's all about machinery and, and mechanics and, well, a lot of it is. And uh, I've loved it all my life, really. So, but I never realised that I, I could ever get to grips with it physically like this. And uh, I joined the poppy line and I was in the ticket office. And uh, every time a steam locomotive came, I used to come out and look at it and... Uh, and then some, suddenly somebody said, well, you know, you could, you could be a cleaner if you wanted to be. So how many more years do you think cleaning before you get a go on the big red lever? I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm willing to wait until I really know what I'm doing so that when I'm doing it, I'm confident. And uh, I just enjoy what I'm doing now, so eventually I'll, I'll get there. I'm glad she's prepared to wait. It means I can hop aboard again and have another drive myself. It might run on fossil fuels. It might be noisy and dirty to operate and at times uncomfortably hot to work in. But I know for sure that no electric train puts a smile on the driver's face like this old survivor. Ah, the Great British Cuppa. It's been our national drink for nearly 200 years, but it first arrived here in the 17th century. And back then it was a pricey tipple. Never mind a tea break, unless you were wealthy, you wouldn't have got near this stuff at any time of the day. This is Catherine Street in Westminster, named after Catherine of Braganza, wife of Charles II and the woman who introduced tea to fashionable society in 1662. This was a time when coffee houses were beginning to take over London. Sound familiar? With thousands of the places setting up across the capital, coffee was a cutthroat business. So here in the Strand, one ambitious young proprietor brewed up a cunning scheme to boost trade. And what was his master plan? Simple. He decided to branch out by selling tea as well as coffee. His name was Thomas Twining, and although it said he believed tea was a drink with great potential, never in his wildest dreams could he have imagined it would become the nation's favourite pick-me-up. The business started way back in 1706 and is still trading from the same premises today. It's been handed down through ten generations of the family, all the way to the current Mr T, Stephen Twining. So Thomas started with a coffee shop here and coffee was enormously popular. What do you think was it that made him think tea would help the business? I, I think two things. Firstly, uh, he'd done an apprenticeship in tea, therefore he knew what he was talking about. Uh, and the second thing is that in the city of London, uh, which is what, 150 yards that way, there were over 2,000 other coffee houses. So he wanted to differentiate his coffee house, give his customers a different choice of, uh, of beverages. Uh, and of course, it was the tea that then took off. But in the early days, it was an expensive luxury, thanks to the efforts of the brewers who didn't like the competition from the new kid on the block. We had to process our water in those days because table uh, drinking water was not safe uh, out of the tap and therefore the brewers made it into a very light weak beer which we drank for breakfast, lunch and dinner and what the brewers feared was that if people started making tea, of course you've got to boil the kettle, that makes the water safe to drink and they would lose a lot of business. So they got together with the clergy and the, and the medics and lobbied the government and persuaded them to impose a huge tax on tea, making it so expensive that it really became a drink for the wealthy and the aristocracy. Yes, I'm thinking in today's prices, apparently, uh, 100 grams of tea would have cost £160. Yes, uh, and that's not going to be an everyday drink. Despite the high prices, business soon began to flourish. And before long, the first Mr Twining opened a takeaway at the front of the shop. That allowed well-heeled ladies to buy their dry tea without braving the bawdy coffee house at the back of the building. 
if you came into the shop and wanted tea, we would have uh, mixed the blend of tea together uh, and then literally wrapped it in the paper. And that package had to get home without obviously spilling the tea. Once the precious leaves had been wrapped and safely carried home, they were kept under lock and key in caddies like this one. Certainly when tea was at its most expensive, you needed to be able to lock it away. It had to be a safe box. And inside, generally speaking, there were two compartments, one for green tea and one for, for black tea. Uh, earlier tea caddies would have a B and an H initials, Bohir and Heisen. But this one is the deluxe version. It comes with a mixing bowl. The idea was that you took some of the, uh, the, 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 the green tea out of these airtight storage containers, which is the third part of a tea caddy, uh, and some of the, the black tea, mix it together and, and then transfer it your teapot and obviously then carry on to brew the tea. So people were certainly blending their own teas um, to get it just the way they liked it. So from very early on, an important part of the process was blending to the individual taste. Yes, uh, the skill Twinings have is to, to blend teas and then we realised that we could do it for, for individual people. Um, you could have, like you can go to Savile Row and get a, a tailor-made suit, you can, uh, uh, you can have tailor-made teas, absolutely to, to your specification. The price of tea finally plummeted in the 1780s, thanks to this chap, Richard Twining, who persuaded the government to cut the tax. And so yes, in 1784, William Pitt bought that argument, Commutation Act went through, and that facilitated us becoming a nation of tea drinkers. After that, tea never really looked back. Its popularity rose steadily during the Victorian period, and by the last century, it really was the quintessential English drink. Or as George Orwell put it, one of the mainstays of civilization in this country. I'll drink to that. But first, I have one final question for the man whose family first inspired our love affair with tea. Pinky up or down? Uh, in the old days they had the pinky up, but uh, these days I tend to put the pinky down. Marvellous. Next time on Sugsy Survivors, I'll be tracking down the remains of the legendary Crystal Palace and buying a ticket for an old-style picture house. Well, I tell you what, I think I'm a sixpenny man myself. Sixpence, then.